Hi, this is a lecture for nanofabrication technology. We are at lecture two, and the content for this lecture would be focusing mainly on surface energy. Okay, and if we start to look at a bulk material, a piece of material like this, and if I zoom in here just to see a uh, atomic arrangement. Suppose the material have the simple cubic cell, like so. All the red dots here are atoms within the materials bonding together. If I have a knife and I'm trying to cut a material into two pieces according to this plane, that means I'm cutting the bond. Physically, I can use a knife to cut the bond. And Two, the materials are broken into two pieces. If I remove the top piece, I'm exposing a newly formed surface. Right? So on this surface, there are atoms. Suppose I cut this material cleanly, an atom atomic arrangement on the surface remains the same as what it was in the bulk material. And if I zoom in there, I can see all the atoms on the surface, highlighted in yellow here, are called surface atoms. If you look closely, you see that atoms underneath the surface, which belongs to the bulk, bulk of materials. At this point, for this particular example, this atom has six bonds, right? two on the left and the right, one on the top, one in the bottom, one in front of you, and another one behind it. So there's six equal bond trying to attract on this atom. If you look at the force acting upon this atom, you see that this atom is perfectly balanced because the force on the left and the right are balancing each other, top and, bo and the bottom balancing, balancing each other, and the one in front of you and the one behind it also balancing each other. So this atom is in the state of balance. On the other hand, atom on the surface, like this atom, this particular atom, the number of bond acting on this atom is now reduced. Right now this particular atom has only five bonds. One, two, three, four in front of it, in front of this screen, and five on the back. Just five bonds. On the left and on the right, the forces are balanced. But in this vertical axis, the force is no longer balanced. Right? It seems like we have attraction force trying to pull this atom downward. If so this this particular atom on the surface is no longer no longer balanced. It is unbalancing bond. So therefore if I want this atom to stay at this particular position it seems like I have to use some extra energy to pull this atom upward to remain the same position. This extra energy supplied to this atom, or you can say that this atom is no longer balanced, is no longer at the stable phase, so it is a little bit more excited than the atom in the bulk. This additional energy is called surface energy. Okay? So if someone asks what is the surface energy? It is basically additional energy that surface atom have comparing to atoms underneath the surface. Extra energy means Extra energy can, can mean two things. 
first atom is no longer stable. As you can see, this particular atom is not stable in terms of the balancing of the force. Okay? If it is not stable, it can also mean this atom is more active. So surface energy can also represent activity of atoms on the surface. The higher the surface energy, the more active they are. In order to approximate the surface energy, we can just roughly look from the balance of the bond itself. It can be calculated roughly according to this equation. Surface energy is half of NB, which is the number of bonds being broken, times the bond strength or the energy of the bond, and the number of atoms on the surface per unit area. Or row A, this is called surface atom density. All right? Let me give you an example. If I have bulk material in FCC structure of face center cubic cell, like this, all of the green balls are atoms. Okay, they are on the face center cubic cell. This is one cell, one unit cell. If I have another unit cell landing on top of each other, now this picture shows you two cells. All right. If I pay my attention on this red ball, this ball, or re this red atom, right now, this atom seems to have four surrounding neighbors. Okay? If the lattice has a size of A, it is cubic structure, so therefore, this size, this size, and this size are all A. The bond length, the length between the atom of our interest and the neighbor atoms, this red line shows you the bond length. You can use geometry to calculate the bond length here to be square root 2 over 2 of A. Because this side is A, this is A, so from here to there, that is square root 2 of A. So the bond length is just half of it. So it is square root 2 of a over 2. So whether we're looking at this ball, this ball, or that ball, they're equally apart from the center atom. Okay? However, if I look at another layer of atoms on top of this red atom, this layer, if I remove the, if I clear view a bit, and look at the distance between our atom of interest and this particular atom. The blue line is the distance of bond length. Okay? You can see that this length is A over 2 because red atom stays at the center of the plane. So this is A over 2. On the other hand, the green ball here stay at the center of the face as well because the, cent the lattice is face center unicell. So therefore this length is A over 2. It's also A over 2. If I have A over 2 over here, this is also A over 2. The length of the blue line will be square root 2 of A over 2. Like this. So you can see that the length of this blue line and the red line here are essentially equal. So that means these four atoms on this layer and these four atoms on the bottom layer, they are essentially the same, right? So all of these 12 atoms on these three layers, the first layer on top, one layer in the middle, and the third layer at underneath here, all of them, all of atoms, are in the same distance from the red atom. In other words, 
we can say that our red atoms has 12 closest neighbors or the coordination number of atom in this FCC structure is 12 okay so there are 12 atoms with the same distance from the atom of our interest All right so coordination number is 12 it is true only for this particular structure if I change from FCC structure to something else like I change from FCC face center cubic cells to body center cubic cells the coordination number will be totally different okay so again the coordination number depends on crystal structure for this particular examples it is 12 now if I'm looking from the front of this lattice I can see this picture all the green atoms highlight here at the center of the picture is here so we have one two three another ball under underneath it so four balls in this layer four balls here with an addition of one red ball in the center and four balls at this layer okay so total of 12 balls around the red atom now if I cut this plane how many bonds are being broken you can see that now I have one two three four atoms being cut so the from three-dimensional picture this bond one bond two bonds three bonds and four bonds are being cut okay so in order to expose this surface I have to cut four bonds so the number of bond being broken or NB in this particular example for this particular plane is four all right after removing the top layer so if I cut the top part I'm exposing this surface I highlight by yellow plane and for this system this plane is being 001 plane all right now I'm going to calculate how many atoms are sitting on this yellow plane so the number of atoms on 001 plane you can count right now we have one ball one red ball totally sitting on the yellow plane this ball this green ball sit on the yellow plane as well but only by a quarter okay just quarter of its atom is sitting on the plane the rest are not on the yellow area it's the same for this atom this atom and that atom so for all these four green atoms they occupy only one-fourth of the surface area of the yellow area so I have four of one one quarter okay so one ball here this is the red one and four of the green ones sitting on the yellow planes the total number on the yellow plane is therefore uh, two and the area of this yellow area the size is a here this is also a so the area of 001 plane is a squared therefore surface density is two atom per the area of a squared all right so if I plug this NB and rho A into an equation I get surface energy of this 001 plane to be half of NB times bond strength times rho A of course the bond strength depends on material 
if I change material, for instance, from copper to iron, then the bond strength will be changed. All right. But anyway, for this particular example, the surface energy for this plane is for epsilon over a square. Okay. Now, if I go back to the bulk material before being cut. And I cut it differently. Now, if I cut along this line, the orange line shows you the cut line. Okay. If I remove this piece out, you can see that this ball, this, 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 and that were bonded to my red atoms originally. Let me show you again. Let's go back. Okay. This whole piece will be removed like so. So all of these atoms that were bonded to the red atoms were removed. In other words, this plane cuts five bonds. Okay. The bonds being cut are highlighted by pink. You can see one, two, three, four, five. Five bonds being cut. So therefore, NB is equal to five for this particular plane. When you cut this plane, okay, you can see that the area highlighted by yellow square here has no atom sitting on it at all. When you cut it, the, the exposed surface is really this plane. All these planes, there are atoms sitting on it or located on the plane. All right. So even though you cut this at this location, the newly formed surface is formed here. All right. So if I remove the top lattice and I highlight the surface newly formed, which would be yellow, yellow plane here. The plane is indicated by Miller index 110. So how many atoms are there on the yellow plane? So you can count. The red atom sits on the yellow plane by only half. Same, same applies as this green atom. So you have the number of atoms on this 110 plane equal to 2 multiply by half here these two atoms sits on the plane by half these four atoms sits here by a quarter so two times half plus four times a quarter that's equal to two so total of two atoms are sitting on this yellow plane the area of the plane the height here is a the length here is square root 2 of a according to geometry. So the area is square, square root 2 of a square. Okay. So atomic density on the surface would be 2, 2 atoms over square root 2 of a square. And surface energy of this 110 plane can be calculated by the same equation to be 5 epsilon over square root 2 of a square. Now you will notice that the first plane that we calculate, we get surface energy to be 4 epsilon over a square. But the second one that we calculate, when we cut it differently, the energy are different. All right. If you cut it in 1, 1, 1 plane, and you do the same thing, you repeat the same procedure, you end up with different surface energy. So my point here is that surface energy of different phase or different planes, even for the same system, are different. So surface energy depends on the phase, depends on the plane. All right. And you also see that if you try to cut it into other planes, having Miller index to be 
higher than one. Let's say this plane, the purple plane. This is no longer one one zero. It is something with the number higher than one, and you calculate the same surface energy. You see that the energy of this blue plane or violet plane here would be much higher than that of one one zero. So in summary, there are two things. First. Surface energy depends on the phase, depends on the plane. Then, the plane with low Miller index number usually give you low surface energy. Okay. So even though these three planes have different energy, but in general their energies are much lower than energy of other planes. So that's why crystals in nature usually form geometric form or crystal with geometric form, simple geometric form like cube. Okay, because all the cubes have the planes with low surface energy. So basically, nature tries to minimize surface energy. Anything with high energy is not stable. All right. So, if it is possible, nature would try to do everything to minimize surface energy. So, until the end of this lecture, we will try to answer these questions. First, why are lattice parameters of nanoparticle? Significantly different than those of bulk material. In this question, if you take bulk material and subject it to X-ray diffraction, you can calculate lattice parameters. Okay, and you repeat the same thing, same measurement for nanoparticles. You see that the lattice parameters obtained from nanoparticles is usually different than those you measure from bulk material. Why? That's the first question. The second question we already answered actually partly. Explain why sodium chloride crystals are naturally cubic, but water droplets are spherical. The first part of the question was answered by the lattice that I just explained. Okay, sodium chloride has rock salt structure, which is basically face center cubic cells. And for instance, of cubic cells, the energy of the Miller index plane, which are low, like zero zero one plane, zero one zero plane, or one zero zero plane, they are really much lower than others. So therefore, nature usually form sodium chloride crystals to be a cube, like so, simply because nature tries to minimize surface energy. What about droplets of water? Why don't we see water to be cube? Why we see? Why do we see water as a spherical droplet? We will answer that in a minute. The third question: What makes silicon one 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 plane form like this, seven by seven? That's a uh, the way the notation how to describe surface arrangement. Okay. Basically, seven by seven silicon one 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 looks like this. Each point here is silicon atoms. So, why do silicon one 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 plane arrange itself into this complicated structure? We will answer it in a minute. All right. In general, the rule of thumb is that high surface energy. Means atoms or particles are not stable. Anything with high energy means low stability. Okay, and nature does not like low degree of stability. Nature does not like high energy. So we will, nature would try to do everything just to adjust itself, adjust the materials, so that the Total surface energy will be minimized. Adjustment can be done in two ways. 
First, it can be done during formation of the material itself, just like when you try to synthesize nanoparticles. During the synthesis, when atoms comes together to form particles, during that time, atomic arrangement can be adjusted so that surface energy will be minimized. Okay? That is called during formation. Or, once you already form a particle, somehow if you allow particles or allow atoms on the particles to move, atoms would rearrange itself, adjust itself to minimize total surface energy again. That's after formation. Okay? Minimization of surface energy can be done in three levels. Individual surface level, that means suppose you look at a particle, a cube, cubical particles. Each surface can rearrange itself to minimize individual surface energy. The second level is individual nanostructure level, which includes all surfaces of one single particle. Okay? So the second level consider every possible surfaces of one single particle. And the third level, overall system level, considers all particles within the system that you provide. Alright? Let us start with the first level, one single level. For this level, there's so many ways to minimize total surface energy. For instance, the first thing is going back to this atomic arrangement in the simple cubic cells that we used to explain about surface energy. We explained earlier that the yellow atoms on the surface have higher energy than the red atoms simply because we imagine some invisible hands that apply to these yellow atoms to pull it up against this attraction force on the bottom here to make all, a all the atoms on the surface stay at this position. Alright? That makes all yellow atoms having higher energy than usual. But if you allow all these yellow atoms to relax, in other words, you allow these yellow atoms to go along with the attraction force down here, like so. It is relaxed according to the force pulling it down. Okay? This means you no, you no longer provide energy to make these yellow atoms staying at this position. So the surface energy will be relaxed or will be lower. This behavior is called surface relaxation. Okay? And surface relaxation is one way to lower surface energy. Relaxation can be done in many ways. This is called inward shift. Okay? This picture is called lateral shift. The shifting of the very top layer can be done in any direction which makes the whole system or the whole surface here lower in energy. One thing that you will see is that the lattice parameters of this lattice. If you look at this lattice, originally the size of the lattice is A. Okay, this is A, this is also A, but after the surface relaxation, it is smaller than A. It's no longer A. That is the main reason why lattice parameters of nanoparticles is usually different than that of the bulk. Okay, so surface relaxation is one thing, one cause that makes the lattice parameters of nanoparticles usually smaller 
than those of the bulk. All right. The other way to minimize surface energy is what we call surface restructuring. Just like this. Let's see. Let's imagine this to be silicon. All right. This silicon, the yellow one, is on the surface. It is surface atoms. If you imagine this red atom having three bonds, okay? Let's let's consider it in two dimension. In this picture, it has three bonds. One, two, three. Of course, this atom is supposed to have three bonds as well. But on top of that, on top of this layer, there's nothing else, nothing to be bond with the yellow atoms. So we have unbonded electrons. This unbonded electrons sometimes is called dangling bond of free hands. The free hands, free electrons that can be bond with anything. Okay. So I use this dotted line to represent dangling bond of free electrons. And you have learned from physics or basic chemistry that electrons is usually being stable if it can be shared with other atoms, right? That's the basic fundamental of covalent bond. There's a sharing of electrons. The point here is this is electrons. This is also electrons. If these two electrons can be shared, then it would form a covalent bond which is more stable. The point is these two atoms are too far for the bond to be formed. In order to form a bond, when the bond is formed, the energy will be lower, right? Because these electrons, the free electrons, makes the whole atoms unstable. In other words, it's no longer it's not as stable as atom underneath. So we can make these yellow atoms stable or less unstable if we can make these two electrons to form a bond. Okay? How can we form a bond when the distance are too far? Basically, we can shift them, shift two atoms, like so. Shift it together until the distance is close enough for a bond to be formed. When the bond is formed, the number of free electrons will be reduced. The number of instability will be reduced. In other words, surface energy will be reduced. The movement of these atoms is called surface restructuring. So if you look from the top, look for the surface arrangement, before and after surface restructuring, you can see the difference. Okay? This is the reason why silicon 111 form a pattern that I showed you earlier. The third way to minimize surface energy is like this. When you have silicon with dangling bond, okay? This dangling bond can be eliminated by forming a bond. Forming with what? According to this structure, there's no way we can move these silicon atoms to do the surface restructuring because it is part of the network. The other way to eliminate these free electrons is to bond it with something else like hydroxyl group. Hydroxyl group, this yellow ball is oxygen, the blue ball is hydrogen, okay? So when we have hydroxyl group, the hydrogen here is terminated. Hydrogen has one, one bond, one electron to be bond with something else. Once it's bond with oxygen, it's terminated. There is no longer dangling bond from hydrogen. So this surface is now stable. Okay? Capturing of hydroxyl group to silicon like this is called surface adsorption. So 
where is the source of hydroxyl group? Basically, you can get hydroxyl group from moisture. Okay, so whenever we have silicon, bare silicon exposing to moisture, silicon hydroxide like this can be formed. Basically, just to minimize surface energy. Okay, so these are ways to reduce energy of one single surface. It is called indi individual surface minimization, surface energy minimization. Another level, the second level, consider all surfaces of one single particles. It is called nanostructure level. Basically, the particles can change the shape of the particles to minimize surface energy. Okay? There are two cases. First, for liquid or amorphous solid. Amorphous solid means the solid that does not have a pattern atomic arrangement. Okay? The atomic arrangement in amorphous solid is random. Just like atomic arrangement in liquid. In order to reduce overall surface uh, energy of a particle, basically you can reduce overall surface area. Okay? For, to for fixed volume, the shape that gives you the lowest surface area is sphere. So that's why for liquid, like droplets of water, in order to minimize surface area, the droplets would form spherical droplets. Okay? But if you have crystalline solid, just like what we discussed earlier, it would form crystal with phases that have the minimized surface energy. So crystal like cubic would be very common in nature because all the phase of cube have low surface energy. Okay? Now, if I have a cube like this, let's say it is a solid with um, simple cubic cells, okay? When we try to count the number of bonds of atoms within the particles, you see that at the center, atoms usually have six bonds for simple cubic cells. And the number of bonds will be reduced when I move or when I consider atom on the face. On the face, the number of bonds is reduced from six to five. Right? Now, if I consider atoms on the edge, atom on the edge now have the number of bonds to be four. Let's say if I consider one particular atom on this edge, there's one bond on the left, one bond on the right, one bond this direction, and the other bond on the back, four bonds. Okay? If I consider atom on the corner, now the number of bonds will reduce further to three. So if you compare atoms at different locations, you can see that atoms at the corner is lower in stability comparing to atoms on the face. Because the number of bonds of atoms at the corner is much lower. In the word, on the other word, I can say that atom at the corner has much higher surface energy than atoms on the face, right? Whenever atom is stable, it has low energy. Whenever it is unstable, it has high energy. Okay? So, if the particles is cool, that means atoms everywhere on the surface has low energy to move. When atoms does not have enough energy, it stays stationary. 
it does not move. Okay? We can also say that mobility of atoms at low temperature is very low. But if you try to heat it up, if you heat the particles up, you provide energy to atoms on the surface. Okay? And if you compare atom on the face here and atom at the corner, providing the same amount of energy, atom at the corner should have enough energy to break bond first because it is bound to only three bonds, while atoms on the face here is bound to five bonds. So when you heat it up, atom at the corner will start moving first. Okay, where does it go? Of course, if atoms at the corner moves from the corner to the face, it changes the number of bond from 3 to 5. It becomes more stable. And under the same temperature, when it becomes stable, it does not move anymore or it is harder to move comparing to when it stay at a corner. In the big picture, atoms at the corner or at the edge would move to the face and stay there. Right? So when you heat it up, you see the change in morphology of the particles. Your particles would change from perfectly sharp edge a cube like this to a bit rounded cube because atom at the edge on the, at the cube have higher mobility comparing to on the face okay and it moves somewhere else that it's more stable when you heat it further and further higher and higher temperature until all the atoms have the same mobility now it's moving around. When it starts moving around, it behaves like liquid. And whenever we have liquid, in order to minimize surface energy of the whole particles, the surface or the morphology of the particles turns to sphere. So you can convert from perfectly cube into a droplet when you heat it up. You can also imagine changing from solid to liquid. All right. The temperature when it start moving or uh, we we can say that we provide energy by providing heat. And the heat would give you thermal motion of atoms. Whenever thermal motion of atoms dominates the surface energy that holds back the point where st atoms start moving is called surface roughening temperature. The temperature where atoms start moving around is called surface roughening temperature. Okay? So the process changing the temperature or changing from perfectly aligned atoms to randomly aligned atoms is called surface roughening. The, the phenomena is called roughening of the surface. The third level to minimize surface energy considers many, many particles at the same time. Okay, it is called overall system level. So now we consider groups of particles. How can we minimize energy for groups of particles? There are two ways, centering and Oswald ripening. Okay, let us start with centering by looking at two particles. If I take two particles moving together, once they're in contact, they join. Why do they join? Because joining between two particles minimize surface, right? Before joining, 
total surface area can be calculated from surface area of individual particles combined. You can see that after joining, this is no longer surface. Now it turns to be interface. The total surface area is reduced. That's the way we minimize surface energy. Of course, you see that atoms on the surface here should be bonded to the bulk with lower number of bond comparing to atoms at this junction okay so atom at this junction should becomes more stable that means if you heat it up to some certain level that atoms can move it would prefer to stay at the junction. Migration of atoms from the surface to the junction give you this behavior. Okay, so the interface become larger and larger and two particles somehow join together. This process is called sintering. Sintering can be found in daily life by looking at the ice, okay? If you have cubic of cube of ice together, leave it for a while, leave them for a while, it would join together into a structure of ice. That's a daily example of sintering. Now, if you start with two particles with a single crystals, after sintering, it turns into one single particles, but the particles is no longer single crystals. This particle is now polycrystals. So sintering usually form polycrystals. The thing about sintering is you can break these two particles apart simply by using external force. You can hammer it down, breaking into two parts. But these two parts are no longer the same as the particles before sintering. So sintering would change morphology of your particles permanently. Okay. So sintering is often used for the fabrication of ceramic parts. So if you have ceramic powder, like so, you can put them together under pressure and heat it up. They are sinter together from particles like this into joint particles or sinter specimen like this and you can form complicated shape this rotor is formed by ceramic powder okay you form into this shape and heat it up sintering occurs and now the whole specimen seems to be one single piece the second things for overall systems surface energy minimization is called Oswald ripening Oswald ripening occurs in solution okay usually solution suppose I'm trying to synthesize nanoparticles by using precipitation in solution let's say let's imagine sugar if I have sugar particles in saturated sugar liquid or syrup okay so you have syrup you cool down the syrup at some certain temperature sugar particles crystallize out of the sugar uh, out of the syrup water the solution itself is saturated because the solution contains water and sugar sugar is solute water is solvent okay concentration of solute reaches the saturated point or reaches the solubility of sugar okay suppose I have two particles of sugar form one is big the other one is small solution here is saturated now if the particles are not nanometers then nothing would happen but if the particle size is in nanometers there's a thing that there's a thing that 
can be proven to you that smaller particles okay which has higher radius of curvature whenever you have higher radius of curvature you have higher surface energy and usually smaller particles have higher solubility what does it mean under the same solution particle has higher solubility means it has higher tendency to dissolve it's easier to dissolve smaller particles out okay so in nanoscale solubility depends on size the smaller the particles the higher the solubility okay now keep in mind that these two particles stay within the same solution but the smaller particles has higher solubility all right so that means part of these particles part of these smaller particles or sugar molecules in this case can dissolve out of the small particles even though the solution is saturated okay it's saturated comparing to the big particles around big particles concentration of sugar in water around these big particles is equal to the solubility of the particle itself that's called saturation but the solubility of the small particles is higher so therefore the concentration of solution around small particles has not yet equal to its solubility so that means small particles can still dissolve okay as long as the concentration has not reached solubility limit yet so so uh, we can still have dissolution of the solute out of the solid so I have dissolution out simply because solubility of this particle is still higher than the concentration at this moment once it's dissolved out that means concentration of sugar around this area is higher than concentration of sugar around this area okay when you have differences in so, so concentration it gives you the driving force for diffusion so there will be diffusion from place with higher concentration to place where concentration is lower so this is diffusion so my sugar here diffuses from here to there okay once it reaches the area around large particles now keep in mind that large particles already have solubility equal to concentration of the solution around here it has low solubility in other words sol solution concentration around these large particles already reaches solubility limit so whenever you have additional solute into saturated solution what would happen crystallization right so whenever the so the sugar here arrive the area around here it reaches the solubility limit so it's crystallized so precipitation of this solute onto the particles occurs so we have precipitation so in the big picture you have mobility of the solute from small particles to big particles 
making the big particles even larger and small particles even smaller. And you have to imagine when small particles become smaller, its solubility becomes higher. It's easier to dissolve. So the process accelerated. Okay? This whole process making the small particle disappear and making the large particle even larger is called Oswald ripening. Okay? In Oswald ripening, crystal growth occurs by the expense of small particles. And it usually occurs in solution in liquid. So we will use this Oswald ripening for our advantage sometimes along the road. And you can see that once the small particles disappear, then we only have the large particles and the total surface area of the whole system becomes smaller. The smaller the surface area, the smaller the surface energy, and the whole system becomes more stable. So this Oswald ripening is another way to minimize surface energy. Alright, so for this lecture, I give you, start giving you the idea of surface energy. Basically, just to emphasize that the higher the surface energy, the lower the stability. Okay? So the key is, during the synthesis of nanoparticles, we will try to minimize surface energy. Minimization can be done in three levels. One surface level, one particles, and many particles. Right? So that's it for this lecture.